Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Eric Airlock. This is my tiger. This is Tiger. And today we're gonna have the last talk for the Greek philosophy class. This guy was again attacking my foot. The cats have somehow Pavlovianly learned that when I start doing things on the computer, it's an excellent time to bug my feet because I am a fool and I will then try to distract them. So that's a great way to get a distraction, isn't it? Like a cat. Who are themselves a distraction that needs distracting. Yes, so meta. So, hopefully, again, uh, you guys have been enjoying the videos and all that. This is the final video for the class for this series. I will do more on Greeks in the future. Next semester, um, and in fact, I have more to do on Aristotle and logic. I am going to be doing carefully in the next, uh, well, week or two. And my apologies on the lateness with all of that. Hey, again, buddy. Is it? Yeah. Unfortunately, um, well, this is the final video for now um, for the class. We've done a lot, uh, covered a lot, and I only got the video equipment up and running uh, sort of at the last moment. Well, midway through the semester, not last moment. Uh, but this is the final video here on Stoicism. And hopefully you have gotten a decent amount out of the my lesions. And then Pythagoras, the Eleatics, Parmenides and his confusing uh, everything, Heraclitus. And we also then have all the Plato, the Aristotle, and now through the skepticism and Epicurus, we have Roman Stoicism. So we're going to finish out here on one Greek and one Roman, which does sort of hand the torch off here, that Epictetus, who was a Stoic slave who lived in Rome... I believe, though, was Greek in origin uh, and ethnicity. We then have Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Aurelia, <laughs> we have Marcus Aurelius, not Billus Aurelius, but Marcus Aurelius. And we have, he is a Roman emperor. I'm not sure how much anybody ghost wrote for him, ghost writ, and it was written as his uh, stoic tutors and or hired help. But Marcus Aurelius is known as a powerful Stoic thinker himself as a Roman emperor. And this is uh, certainly before Constantine and then the Roman Empire turned uh, somewhat Christian. Uh, again, I still have to do the video about Ashoka and India turning decently Buddhist. Uh, and uh, Ashoka is the Indian Constantine. And his granddaddy fought Alexander. And all that is amazing if you do uh, Indian, Greek, and Chinese philosophy. But we're going to talk about Epictetus and then Marcus Aurelius here. The Greek slave in Rome and then the Roman emperor. The uh, both Stoics and clearly Marcus Aurelius, kind of like the situation of Diogenes asking Alexander to stand the heck out of his sunlight, you sun king, you, of course, we have here Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, certainly learning a lot from a slave. Many would know this, even as he keeps the title emperor. He is clearly in Rome saying things that people would identify with Epictetus and a earlier slave that were famous. And then Christianity comes a bit after that. So we already have a Roman emperor telling you, I have a beautiful philosophy for all the people. That is quite beautiful in the words. It's amazing. And it sounds like he's talking like everybody would know, an amazingly wise slave. Which would already set you up to somewhat have a religion that is into the lowliest of people being the highest of kings. And yet the power continues, of course, in so many forms, and so do all plenty of the human problems, and nothing against or not this or that form of thought. But it remains, of course, as it does today, quite human. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Epictetus, who lived uh, from 55 to 135 CE, so that means he's a lot. He was born uh, in the decades following, uh, likely right around the time Jesus uh, was uh, exiting, uh, you know, exiting the scene. Uh, crosswise was a Stoic slave who lived in Rome, and again, the Romans uh, were the ones who, uh, well, with the crosswise. Epictetus's master was secretary to the infamous Emperor Nero, who supposedly fiddled while Rome burned. After acquiring his freedom, Epictetus taught Stoicism in Rome until philosophers were banned from Rome by Emperor Domitian in 89 CE, which was a ploy, many say, 
to get rid of rivals who happened to be very into Stoicism. It clearly did not completely take because later you have Marcus Aurelius. But that Domitian knew that there were several Stoics who he did not like. So he said, Stoicism, evil, you have to get out of town. And that could have been quite strategic. So moving to Nicopolis, a Greek city between Athens and Rome, Epictetus set up a Stoic school where he taught until his death decades later. Origen, the early Christian historian and philosopher, tells a story about Epictetus when he was still a slave that may be a mere legend, but became a famous illustration of the aims of Stoicism, retold by later philosophers, including Hegel. And Hegel is a German guy, not going to talk about him so much right now. I mentioned him on and off, uh, did my master's work on him a bit, but... Hegel is very important for a lot of European philosophers and European and then American thought because he is a major architect of certain things. And so Hegel tells this story as part of his what the Greeks mean to Germans and, and Europeans and white people and Western civilization. The story goes that once, when Epictetus' master became angry, presumably at Epictetus for maintaining a stoic attitude in a heated moment, his master broke his leg to punish him. Epictetus, undisturbed by the pain or the condition of his leg, responded by criticizing his master for irrationally destroying his own property. Epictetus asked his master, how can you hope to be an effective master, an I effective slave, if I have a broken leg, what gives? Probably while clenching his teeth, I guess, and holding back the tears. It was not to remember that Heraclitus, uh, an inspiration of the Stoics, well, Diogenes, uh, Diogenes is the one who rolls, uh, my mistake, in snow and again in sand uh, to toughen himself up. So maybe he had toughened himself up, he didn't have to win so much, but it was not the pain or the imposition that bothered Epictetus, but the illogical nature, that's not logical, Captain, in Star Trek, of the act while Captain Kirk chases green women, which is not logical, you know? If there are no green women, you can't chase them. What are you, stupid? But using slavery inefficiently is irrational. <clears throat> Here, this is not liberation theology. This ain't. Um, it is in a, yeah. It is not liberation. It is like, well, use your slaves wisely, everyone. You know. So Epictetus probably didn't like slavery, but again, he is not on record actually saying let's revolutionize society. But I'm sure he didn't like that and doesn't like terrible. So it's not in accord uh, with the cosmic logos. Not necessarily to not have slaves, but to do things. If you smash your laptop, uh, the word robot, again from the Slavic, means slave. And then our machines are robots or automated slaves, uh, a.k.a. Detroit, you know, become human. Is that, yeah, the robots and the slaves, you know, and they, I think, put the robots in the back of the bus, which is which people are like, wow, that's a very, you know, uh, well-planned, yeah, well-plotted metaphor, everyone. No one gets that. Is that epic, uh, basically that using your laptop irrationally, you know what I mean, against uh, your friend's, you know, face is not rational, Captain. Of course, yes, yeah, smashing it any kind of way isn't. And yeah, we're not talking about the slavery here and, uh, you know, well, yeah, you know, us and of them... Is not what they're talking about here. Epictetus was said to have a lame leg by various sources, but according to the Stoic philosopher Seneca, I haven't actually done much on him at all. That is another guy who could add more Roman stuff in the future, and will. That Epictetus was born with the deformity. So actually, some say that this is a legend that may have been told and wedded to him later, that he may not have told of himself or uh, anybody told him during his life as he may have objected to it. Not sure. Epictetus taught that, whether or not his leg was broken on purpose or he was made lame purposefully, which is terrifying, but old world punishment, that whenever we are disturbed, we should say to our negative emotion, you are an impression, nothing more. That sounds rather skeptical. But of course, the Stoics believe some is to be skeptical as apart from the fate and the truth and the light. So we decide calmly whether or not, notice the forking why we need to one or the other, I talked about this last time, whether or not we can change the situation for the better. Give me the strength to change what I can, prayer of St. Francis, the wisdom, the patience to endure what I can't, and the wisdom, philosophy, choice, rationality with Aristotle to know the difference. So we decide calmly whether or not we can change the situation for the better. If we can, we should consider what is best for everyone. If we cannot, we should accept our fate stoically. 
The Taoists say, don't be the praying mantis waving your arms in front of the chariot. You can wave your arms when it does stuff. That's great. Learn semaphore, you know, semaphore. But chariots don't understand semaphore. So if you want to survive or your kids want to eat, I would get out of the way, you know? So it depends, though. You have to be wise. It's not just total bury yourself in a hole. That's not good enough either. You have to use discretion. So if we can, we should consider, again, wisely, what is best. If we cannot, we should accept our fate stoically. And how else would a stoic have you accept your fate? Skeptically? I think not good, sir. This is similar to Peronian skepticism. Insofar as Sextus would say to all impressions, you are an appearance, and I do not have to believe in you. So you are an appearance, nothing more. You will find skeptics the whole world over definitely saying that. Of course, again, if one is more dogmatic, that is because you are saying to the subjective and the mere appearance, you are, you are appearance, nothing more. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, for instance, actually, the Buddhist Vietnamese, I have not yet done a video. I may not have time. I'm going to do a lot on Zen to do a video about Vietnam, uh, a proper video, as opposed to an improper video involving cats. Who's interested in the microphone for some reason? Well, we don't have time to burn. Yes, and we don't have cats to waste. Yes. Because there's energy to burn. Hey, buddy. You go over here. Anyway, yes. So the, uh, let's see here. So we've got, what are we talking about? <laughs> I am thinking of cats. So basically, you are an impression. Again, I don't have to believe in you, unlike I have to believe and interact with my cats. Uh, those are physical, real objects, uh, as opposed to mere impressions, again, uh, that... Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist, I will not have time to do a proper, as was saying, video about Vietnamese Buddhism, but v uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, some have referred to white people who like Buddhism as nightstand Buddhists, you know, because you have a book or two of Thich Nhat Hanh on your shelf. Thich Nhat Hanh, awesomeness to him, and uh, no hate from the hate, and from Berkeley Town, is that he says to a leaf at some point in one of his books, you are just pretending, you know, to a leaf. And it's like, it's not that the leaf isn't anything. The leaf is part of all of us, and that's what's real. But that it's specifically a leaf and completely not anything else, split from an axe from, uh, from other things, like Anaxagoras says you can't, completely any two things in life. To a skeptic, all things are potentially pretending. To a stoic, though, again... Like we had last time, there is more objective knowledge math stuff aside from mere human practice and appearance. So a leaf may be pretending more than math is uh, for a Stoic, which is odd enough because, uh, as Nietzsche would point out much later, for these Platonists and others, that makes the leaf less real than math, which is weird if you stop and think about it. Again, math actually may have been for nobles most of the time. What's <laughs> Just like curiosity has been for cats. The entire time, yes? What's up, buddy? Come on through. No. We merely stand upon the threshold. Or chew upon the mic cord. What is... Yes. We chew upon the mic cords of existence for something rhetorical. Yes? Which one cannot expect of cats? See? You have to see it. You can't hear it, you know? Yes. Anyway... We have minutes to burn, because actually, this is not going to be a long talk. So, as mentioned, I didn't want to cram all this. Uh, don't need to cram the cat. Yes. And we don't, uh, we've got minutes to burn here, because actually, um, this is not going to be an hour-long talk, but I will get right to it. After I've gotten right to the cat. Yes. What's up, buddy? What's up? Let's, let's see if he wants to rest. All right, well, enough time. So, basically, um, uh, that is actually pretty much Epictetus. Uh, so we had there a cat intermission, you know, intermittently there. So we'll just end off here with Stoics like Epictetus uh, would not be skeptical of all impressions, only negative emotions and uh, delusions that arise when we are not in tune with the way of the cosmos. So that said, let's move on here to Marcus Aurelius who lived from 121 to 180 CE. So Epictetus died in 135. 
So that means that Epictetus died when Marcus Aurelius was 14. Now, a 14-year-old, actually, if Epictetus died uh, when Marcus Aurelius was 14, that would probably mean, and I'm just saying this because I've been doing a lot of Buddhist dialogue, well, you will notice in Buddhism, Buddha doesn't have a lot of followers, is presented as having a lot by Buddhism the whole time. Wow, people love the guy from the beginning. Of course, that's what the school and every, that's what people say about their guy. But you can see Buddha's popularity going up in his life. So in his later life, he has much, many more followers and a lot more people are paying attention. So I'm betting Epictetus, he got more and more famous as he lived his life and was probably at a lot like Socrates, like in that painting with Socrates, again, invisible basketball, upward, you know, and then there was like, no, you know, shaming uh, that everybody's like, oh God, you know. Is that, uh, I really want to do the Irish joke version of that. I will spare you all of that and ask me in the comments, I suppose. But basically, Marcus, uh, Marcus Aurelius, when he was 14, probably would have seen Epictetus be extra epic and have followers and be a stoic. So when Marcus Aurelius, probably in his 20s, I imagine, is uh, when he was getting trained in stoicism and then having people, uh, he was writing these texts, which are quite beautiful and brilliant, inspiring words from a Roman emperor, I was already a little cynical. I definitely think this guy gets extra help whether or not he is writing his own text, which of course is a thing for an emperor, not so much the slave. It sounds a lot like Epictetus. He was, and he is clearly speaking to a Roman audience who know who Epictetus the slave is. So listen to this. And I am going to, with uh, less commentary here, finish off on some quotes from Marcus Aurelius which is, uh, oddly enough, appropriate to end up in Rome. So, educated by Greek tutors in Rome, Aurelius wrote his meditations, his philosophical work, uh, one of the finest of ancient Rome, it's considered and appreciated by folks today, and has been, one of the finest of ancient Rome in Greek. So he wrote his philosophy in Greek because you're doing something much like I've been saying. There's uh, been watching Killing of a Sacred Deer and Melancholia. These guys are not French. They are, I guess, a Greek and a depressed alcoholic Swedish guy. But they are clearly doing French stuff somewhat because surrealism's French, you know. So they're doing a lot of French and a lot of film. So they're clearly doing a lot of French film even though they're not French. And you can rely on that. Here we have Aurelius is writing his stuff in Greek, not Roman, because if you're doing philosophy with the Stoics, you do it in Greek. So here come here are the quotes. I love this one, which is why I put it first. When you wake up in the morning, tell yourself, the people I deal with today will be ungrateful, violent, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and uncharitable. All of these things have come upon them through ignorance of good and evil. But I have seen the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil, and have recognized that the wrongdoer has a nature related to my own, not of the same blood or birth, the Roman emperor points out, but of the same mind. Well, if it's all pantheistically the same mind, of course, you and the apple and the horse, and possessing a share of the divine. That's a little panentheistic, almost like the Catholic Church or an emperor saying, oh, there's pantheism, and then a little bit of the upper part of it. I can neither be harmed by any of them, for no one will involve me in wrong, nor can I be angry with them or hate them, nor can I hate a cat that just jumped next to the microphone. For we have come into the world to work together. Either that or I'm working for my cats over here. I have often wondered, Marcus Aurelius says, not my cats, how it is that every man loves himself more than all the rest of men, but yet sets less value on his own opinions of himself than on the opinions of others. I've been mentioning uh, a lot of existentialism and watching those films uh, to folks. And one of the interesting things that existentialism will tell you is in modern life, since we're ending up here in the end of the Greeks and the Romans here in Rome, human beings are remarkably like ourselves in China, Rome, Greece. Hopefully you appreciate that more in watching these talks. One of the things that you can tell in others, I am going to do a lot of videos on Edgar Allan Poe pretty soon. And I'm glad some of my work on that's getting traction. I think that there's hidden, uh, hidden stuff in the first and the third story, also in the second, but that gets uh, quite obvious in the second one. In the first and the third story, there seem to be hidden things that I don't think people have found so much that I think are quite interesting and obvious. But in the obvious words of the text, which then lead to the more hidden things, I think, 
it does say, why are modern people so crappy? Like, why are people so terribly human in spite of all this technology? Uh, as I don't know if Arthur C. Clarke said, why are we primitive apes with godlike technology? Well, the better and worse way you can read that is because we all have the same mind and we all possess a share of the divine and we're a lot like the Romans and the Chinese because we all have the same brains in similar forms of life like drinking liquids and dealing with liars and jerks. So if that's been true since tribes long before literacy, then all of this stuff sounds quite clear. You know, it all is quite wise advice and helps uh, condition how we feel about our fellow human beings, trust, truth, lies, and everything. Which again, we've probably been lying since we were apes. So we learn to tell the truth as we learn to lie, as we learn to talk to ourselves, as we learn to talk to others, all of us, since we're children and humanity, all of it. So uh, what you can see in that, to sum up this point, which one can use the word narcissism way too much, and I'm going to get into Nietzsche and what psychoanalysis says about Nietzsche and the last man and narcissism, which is the surgeon from... Very much a uh, killing of the sacred deer, plenty-ish, it seems. Is that why is it that people seem so conceited and so... Say He's saying this as a Roman emperor in Rome. And it's like, why do people seem to have the world, seem to have so much science, so much math, so much computers, so much stuff, so much diversion, so much YouTube, and yet they seem so cowardly, and they seem so stupid, and it seems like human beings have such potential, such divinity... And then they seem so hollow and so uh, cowardly. Well, that's actually existentialism 101. And while existentialism and I think Killing of the Sacred Deer and Melancholia are existential, not postmodern films, and that they're very pessimistic about modern times, being an accountant and being a surgeon is almost a shamely cowardly thing to be, not a noble thing. Which is a little bit too pessimistic, honestly. Postmodernism is more like, well, the good is the bad, the modern is the ancient, I don't know, man. But in being existential and more classically kind of intellectual pessimistic about modernity and the mechanics, uh, such as Savio here in Berkeley Town says, sometimes you have to throw yourself on the gears of the machine man, you know, and who is the machine man and who speaks for the machine man, man. Is the reason that everybody loves themselves so much narcissistically, but then is so distrustful of their own selves, not just of others, but of themselves in their own mind. How much more science, how many roads must a man walk down as Bob Dylan learns how to sing for the first time? Well, the reason that people have so much in ancient Rome and modern society and remain the same cowards all too often, but not entirely for Heraclitus and the Stoics, and certainly for this here Roman emperor, whose words sound purdy. Why is that? Well, because they don't go back and forth with others, as the Roman emperor says, even though I'm above some of these people, all these jerks are here as my co-workers. I'm just here to go back and forth with exactly the same thing they are, and that doesn't seem to change for thousands of years. Now, if a lot of society and language has changed since Rome, what hasn't changed? You know, let's finish out here again on a couple of these quotes. The object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to be, uh, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. That is, you can just sit back and do that nowadays just by not talking to anyone. But that's obviously, yeah, good luck with all of that. I suggest talking to people occasionally. I talk to my cats. That's uh, far less useless, and yet it is quite useful. Everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. That actually almost sounds skeptical, although we imagine he does mean there are facts beyond. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. Now, that actually does sound like he could be a skeptic, but he would probably say because, like Plato, you, in a certain sense, feel and see and understand with your mind beyond if there is anything objective, you would grasp it with the mind rather than ever grasp it with the hands or have the fire uh, reflecting off it into your eyes. You can get wisdom from looking at things, but wisdom isn't visible. You can hear wisdom in what people say. And in fact, if you're wise enough, you're paying attention to the tone of, your vo of their voice and your voice more than others. It's odd we have to pay attention to the tone of our voice, but there you go. You can more. 
but that's not the tone of voice itself. You can't hear wisdom. What does wisdom sound like? Always like a voice? Like somebody flipping somebody off? What does that sound like? You know? It's again, if it's all together, I'm flipping you off right now, right? You know what I mean? But you just can't see it, can you? Yeah, you just have to remove a couple of the elements, you know? So, yeah, the uh, human attention is selective, but if you look around and if you go back and forth with perspective, you can grasp things further objectively in the mind. It says here, our life is what our thoughts make it. Now, that is almost word for word, and I'm not the one with any of the Latin, but our minds and thoughts make the world is actually one of the opening lines, if not the opening line, of the Buddha's Dhammapada. Which all of this stuff, I think the Buddha is more uh, skeptical than the Stoics, and yet so much of all these philosophies, and Buddha and Plato, line up. Because whether or not you think this or that, you can think a lot of this or that about other things and then sum it up as a philosophy versus another philosophy in this or that way. And we find human beings taking these uh, ways and perspectives anyway. It doesn't stop. And that our life is what our thoughts make it, Marcus Aurelius says, the Stoic, and our mind with our minds we make the world. Uh, the world follows our minds like a chariot, is what the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, and the Dhammapada is one of the earliest, most faithful, and most central short works of Buddhism from the mouth of the Buddha himself. As far as original Buddhist teaching, you can rely upon, it's easy to read, it's central to Buddhism. That is like the opening line of Buddhism. But I do think, again, see Stoicism versus Skepticism to understand actually things the Buddha would be. I think the Hindu may be a bit more Stoic uh, than the Buddha, who is a bit more the Skeptic. And yet so much of Hinduism and Buddhism can be entirely together, as so much of Stoicism and Skepticism in Greece can be quite together. And yet then, 180 and Pythagorean Y and Sigma on you. So significant. He says, how much more grievous are the consequences of anger than the causes of it? Rage destroys itself. It damages its own affairs. I believe are the word are some of the words of Tahotep of ancient Egypt. Although I may be mixing up my ancient Egyptian philosopher, uh, there are a few of them, but I do get them interconfused. A few that we remember or have record of. The best revenge is to be unlike the one who performed the injury, which is a great line uh, from Marcus Aurelius. It's revenge is a dish best served cold. And as one fries a small fish to rule the empire with the Taoists, well, just refraining a bit from acting angry often is more powerful and effective on your opponent. That is certainly true. There are many times when people want you to react a certain way. If you react less, not don't react, but react less, that can be degrees of power. Obviously, that's not advice that's universal for every situation, nor should be followed strictly, because uh, that's not what he's talking about. It is not death that we should fear, but we should fear never beginning to live. Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it, if you have to, with the same weapons of reason which, which today arm you against the present. I have to say here again, I have gotten more and more into a kind of Taoist mind state, which is very, very, as many have compared the Taoists to the Stoics, even though, again, I think the well, the Taoists just see Buddhism, again, are more the skeptics, overall epistemologically, but as far as what they think about truth and words and things. And yet, the Taoists talk a lot like the Stoics, and if the Taoists are like the Stoics and are like you and I, such that I can appreciate this, you can so easily snap, you know, then we are human beings, since we are children, each of us, who are slowly, a bucket fills drop by drop, the Buddha says in the Dhammapada. I think about that all the time, because slowly we are continuously being conditioned, all of us in each and every culture, to and interacting with good and bad people and liars and truth tellers and jerks and people who are nicer, but then turn out to be jerks and then turn out to be nice with the plot twist. Which is why fiction can be good at, at uh, growing and developing the mind and life as can philosophy, even if it seems abstract and uninvolved or too, uh, too meta, bro, beyond. 
is that if you hey, even have the luxury or the horror of meeting the future, you're not going to die tomorrow. You're going to have to deal with the future and all these jerks. Don't worry about it. Why? Well, because in ancient Rome, people had human minds. So they dealt with other human minds, all these jerks, your coworkers. So today, what are you going to do in the future? Well, you don't have to worry about it. Don't be the grasshopper to the ant necessarily, a la Aesop, you know, uh, Greek and Roman times himself, I believe North African. Carthaginian and all of that, that you will have a human mind pretty much in the future, right? You have that already. So you don't need to really worry so much if you're the decent grasshopper grasshopper on storing up your mind for the future because you all you need to do is let the mind shine right now and that's what you're going to do in the future. So just appreciate it right now for what it is because that's being more powerful in the future and a bucket fills drop by drop. So if you let the mind shine now, knowing the mind will shine exactly the same in the future, that itself is oddly enough no change at all. And in the development of individual wisdom, feeling that out freely is a bucket filling drop by drop. So we have the same minds as the Indians, the Chinese, and the Greeks, and the Romans here, and this emperor, I really mean it, Aurelius. But in spite of that, you can, you know, we fear the future, we fear others. Why? Because we know what that is all too intimately. It doesn't change, see? It's going to be something you're going to distrust. Why? Well, you distrust yourself. You're going to be there, you're going to distrust them, you're going to just, in 5,000 years, if humanity survives, we get that blessing and that horror, what's going to happen? There's going to be distrustful jerks, you know? It's like there's going to be people lying and stealing. And there's also going to be mostly people not punching each other in the face and people will be fine. Most of the time, in spite of the rising and lowering of crime statistics, most of the time, most people are fine. It's terrible what I'm telling you. And that's life, dear fellow, as Husselbeck says. So, yeah, it's you're going to meet the future with the same mind you have right now. That's what you had in the past. That's what Romans had in the past. That's what whoever we can't name is going to have in the future. So in that sense, about that, and you having a truth and uh, the humanity telling truth or lies in the future with science and or religion, you can, and then they trade it all out for Zerblat, guess what? It's going to be a lot like this. Because this Roman is a lot like us. I mean, the royal us. Yes, the royal we. As Yakko from Animaniac says, really? To the queen? How many of you are there in there? You know, and like, and she's like, mm, you know, and he's like, how many queens do we got in a queen, you know? How much light do you got in a light? You know, how many units? Uh, is this quantitative? How does it work? I don't know. Again, as uh, Groucho Marx says, why a four-year-old child could understand this. Somebody get me a four-year-old child. Well, maybe I'll have a cat, you know? Perhaps one is in the background. I have a few windows open. So let's, let's have here one or five. We have here another quote. It perfectly matches. Look back over the past with its changing empires that rose and fell, and you can foresee the future too. If you remember back with the Babylonian stuff before the Greek stuff, it says in that pessimistic dialogue, are the master and servant, not the pessimism, that's the other one, of the two, few works surviving of Egypt and Babylon, but probably there were a lot more says, look upon the skulls, Horatio. What changes? Does that mean life is terrible? No. None of these people think life is terrible. None of them want you to be suicidal. Look at the skulls. Look at what changes. Who's smart? Who's stupid now? You know? Eh? Eh? It remains the same. Schopenhauer, before we get to existentialism, uh, Schopenhauer says, the history of a village is the history of an empire. And what he means by that line in German is, you can learn from history that we do not learn from history. And that bucket individually fills drop by drop, and then one's mind pervades the whole. So do every, and the final has, do every act of life as if it were your last. So yes, there you go. So that is the end of the Greek philosophy talks for this semester. Stretch this out to about 35 here, a good half hour. So thank you for me taking you through all the tangents. Hopefully you uh, appreciate, uh, if you would like, please look into the Indian uh, philosophy videos and other Buddhist philosophy videos, especially if you appreciate the backs and forths between 
different schools of Greek thought, as mentioned, you will appreciate Indian thought, which is very similar. And if you appreciate Indian thought and Greek thought, you can certainly appreciate Chinese thought, because Chinese thought is not only like both of them, but then later Chinese thought is highly influenced by Buddhism and Indian thought, and Buddhism is influenced by a lot of Indian thought, which there is probably back and forth influence, which is still debated between Indian and Greek thought. And Indian and Greek thought, along with Chinese thought, is a lot of, not all of, there is, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Hopi, everyone who probably sat around talking about talking and thus had some more and more wisdom drop by drop. But if you know a lot of Indian and Greek and Chinese thought, and I do highly recommend if you like Greek thought to learn Indian and Chinese thought also, please just listen to my talks uh, on that a bit. You can appreciate a lot of the deepest thought of the human world. And if that sounds pretentious or proud, I am not, because unfortunately all this stuff, hopefully, uh, even though I talk very fast, all of this stuff does seem very simple, because remember, a lot of illiterate people thought these were the most meaningful stories of their lives, meaningful points, which is why people wrote them down when there was almost no text and almost, you know, compared to ourselves, nobody's literate. Americans are highly literate, actually have been for a hundred years, which is why actually advertising an Eat at Joe's, it says in Fast Food Nation, became so popular so quick, relying on the works of others, I'm sure, in that book. Americans are highly literate. These are all times when people were not highly literate. Uh, literate uh, literacy in any mathematics at all would often be for nobles or a few and then not for kings and queens. They hire other people to be literate, you know, or know stuff for them a lot of the time. And if they learn to read, well, they don't even need to use it. It's kind of, again, the just the tip joke with mathematics in your life. They don't even need literacy or math. So the nobles like Marcus Aurelius, they can be a philosopher if they want to be like this guy, but they often aren't. So we live in times where there's an amazing amount of literacy and information. So we can actually look now for the first time over Greek, Indian, and Chinese thought. And with just such sim simple things, we can learn so much about common human, cult not only cultural heritage and history, but it's the best stuff to understand the human mind you use to do each and everything each day. I highly recommend that if you like Greek thought, Greek Greco-Roman thought, and I haven't done much Roman stuff, Please listen to some of my talks about Indian and Chinese stuff if you like my talks. And you will see, I assure you, that not only that, but also Islamic thought and American thought, they all have a lot of the similar issues and then are doing similar pieces, not all the same notes with the same instruments, but they are playing very similar tunes in similar ways that you can interconnect for yourself, no matter who you are. And it can, I believe, help you, because if you are going back and forth with human perspectives, as Marcus Aurelius suggests you do with all these jerks and your co-workers and everybody outside the office complex, it can... Drop by drop cause you to have a better mind in life, which is exactly the same mind you have. It's pretty much what you got as your reality. And if everybody else has one, you may as well use it well. So that being said, when I said do every act of life as if it were your last, those were not the last words I spoke, were they? But hopefully some of this has brought a bit of ataraxia to your existence and a little bit of peace and tranquility. You know, if we were merely pigs, we would not know war or peace or Russian literature. And so, hopefully some of these Greek and then Greco-Roman ideas, and then Indian, Chinese, and other, and talking to other people, if you want to do that, in your life, would hopefully, again, continue drop by drop to bring about a little bit of peace, a little bit of happiness, but also thought. Thought itself. So much happiness, everyone. And hopefully you have had a decent semester with everybody locked down. To my students, please uh, turn in your papers uh, and do good work again. Read your work. Make sure it makes sense to you and you like it. And then I'll probably like it fine, you know. And much love, happiness, ataraxia. And I will see you guys, all of you collectively, if I ever see you.